it. So what we're going to do today is talk about table views. We're now on the week five, which means that you've done all this time, you've, you've finished lab four. Yeah, right. <laughs> <coughs> and you're, you're raring to go with lab five. The good news is, at the end of this lab, you've got almost all the skills you need to complete your assignment. The only bit that's missing is data persistence, which you can bolt on afterwards. So you should be starting to design and build your final app, your, your project, your assignment, from this point onwards. You might even decide that if you look at lab exercise for this week, which is almost written, you might decide actually, you know, if you understand it, to get straight on with the assignment. Because obviously you've got three weeks to get it done, two weeks to get it done, two weeks to get it done. You really want to get started on this one. <coughs> two weeks to get it done. And then we move on to advanced iPhone stuff. This is the, this is the basic stuff. Um, it's completely bust. Right, so we're going to talk about table views today. There's three videos on YouTube and Moodle for you to watch. Um, there's one on collection classes. So we're talking about arrays, sets, dictionaries. Okay, they're three really important topics. There's another one on alert views and you know, the pop-up things, you know, the, the way you could use it to app with your app. And the third one, which is the longest one, which is still being edited, I believe, is on table views. You will not be build, building any application without a table view. Yeah, from this point to the end of the whole module. It's so important. So the idea is you can use a table view for static table, static data. There's not a database. So you know the settings app on your phone? You've got that list, haven't you, with all the different apps in it. Then you go in there, you've got switches and, and boxes to type into. That's a static table. There's no database behind there. It's just, it's just fields dragged and dropped onto the interface. Another example is when you go into your uh, calendar and you create a new event, you've got a table view, haven't you? You can click and open up the, the, uh, the uh, calendar. You can put your dates in. You close it up. Each of the cells, they're not records out of the database, are they? They're just, they're just fields and boxes and text boxes and, and all sorts of things. We're not going to cover those for the time being because if you get your head around dynamic database, dynamic tables, then static ones are really easy. We're doing the hard ones. They're called table views because they're used for tabular data. So it's a one-dimensional spreadsheet, if you like. If you want more than one dimension, what you do, you'd have a, a segue to another table view for the next dimension. Does that make sense? So, you know, if you think about your email, you've got your inboxes, you go to your inbox, you go to your messages, you go to your message you drill down through the tables. <coughs> the important thing here is you almost always put a table view with a navigation controller. In fact, if you notice when you dragged your navigation controller in last week, it brought a table view with it, didn't it? Because those two really go together. Even if you've only got one view, it's nice to have it inside the table view because it gives you the header at the top, doesn't it? And it gives you the, um, you know, you can put buttons up there. So I would always use a table view with my navigation. I'd use navigation with a table view. Okay, that's messed up the format in there. Right. Protocols and delegates. You've done protocols, haven't you, and delegate methods. Yeah, you did delegate methods for lab three. Remember with the slider and typing into the box and counting how many characters. There are two protocols you have to implement. You know the protocols are the angle brackets in the header file. There's a data source and there's a delegate. The data source is all about feeding data from the model into the view. And the delegate methods are all about deleting, moving, inserting, and those sort of things. That makes sense. So we're going to cover both of those. And what's important about this is it's really efficient. You can have huge data sets. You can have thousands of records. And when you scroll and flick through, it scrolls nice and smoothly. And I'll explain why in a minute. Right, there are two styles of table view. There is a plain and a group style. Normally for tabular data, we'd use a plain style, but you, your, your, your mileage may vary. You can do what you want with it. The difference is the plain style tends to be just big sets of data. The group style has little spaces between little blocks. So you've seen group style in the settings page, when you have like a little block of settings and a gap, then something else, then a gap. Um, it makes no difference whatsoever to the way it works. It's just a visual thing. There's plain style. Okay, so you can see it's very simple. There's not much space around things. 
and that's group style. You see the heading, the, the heading slightly bigger. There's a bit of space above it. In the old version of iOS, you, the group had little radius corners around them, around the cells. That's all gone now. This is the new group style, which is almost the same as plain style. So a few bits of terminology. We have table cells, and they are subclasses of UI table view cell. So each of the cells in your table view is a subclass of a UI table view cell. So they're objects. And the objects have properties for the text and so on. We have a section, and the section is a block of table view cells. And you can have one or more sections in your table. So you can have it alphabetically, have an A section, a B section, a C section. Um, then we have section headers and section footers. That's the text that appears above and below each section. You have to have those, they're completely optional. And the cell styles, you can build completely custom table view cells. In fact, I'm, I'm working on a walkthrough, a demo, where I build a completely custom cell with gestures and everything in it as an advanced exercise for you, where you swipe and it reveals buttons to interact with different things. It's all quite cool. I've got as far as the swipe, but I'm out of time. That'll be, that'll be done in the next day or so. Um, <coughs> the standard ones are basic, which you're going to use for your lab this week, which is just the title text on the left-hand side. <clears throat> and then you can have a detailed text as well, if you want to. And you've either got right detail, left detail, or subtitle. So it's just arranging those two text views in different ways on the screen. And if you say custom, you can have anything you want. For any of these views, you can also have a UI image. And next week, we're going to talk about files and file handling. I'll do a small diversion into this, showing how you can add an image to your table view cells. So very, very simple, very simple uh, so far. Table view controllers. We did an empty application template last week, and there was a very good reason for that. And the reason is we're going to now work with a table view instead of a view controller. So to create a table view controller, you've got two options. You can either drag and drop the navigation controller, which gives you a table view for free, doesn't it? Or you can simply drag a table view controller out into your storyboard. And when you've done that, <clears throat> you have to add a view controller, of course, don't you? But this time, the view controller <clears throat> is a subclass of the UI table view controller. And if you, if you choose that as your subclass, it's already implemented the correct protocols. In the header file, it's, it's added the correct protocols for you. All these delegate methods are there and commented out, ready for you to use. Okay, so you haven't got to type them all yourself. So if you subclass UI table view controller, you then assign it as a custom class. Remember, in the storyboard, you have to assign the, the view controller for your view. So you choose your custom view controller. And we're now going to look at data sources. This is where it gets a bit more interesting, a bit more of, uh, challenging, the way you think it through. The trick here is the view does not contain the data. Remember that from the model view controller. The data is in the model. The view is just presenting data to the user. So the way we present the data is ties into this model view controller. <clears throat> Let's imagine you've got 10,000 records in your, in your um, data set. The average phone screen can display, what, seven or eight cells, table view cells at once. Think about it, there's about seven, space for seven, isn't there? Then as you scroll, they disappear off the top and one comes in the bottom. But what it does, as soon as one disappears off the top, it, it takes that object and puts it in a pool of cell objects. And then when it needs to insert a new record underneath, it looks for an empty, any, any spare ones in the pool. So it recycles the same UI table view cells over and over again. It only ever generates eight, for instance, if it's a standard phone screen. And as you flick through it simply, Coming off the top, chucking the data away, recycling the cell, putting the next bit of data in as you scroll through the list. So we never have more than maybe seven or eight table view cells in, on, the, on display at any one time. <coughs> this means the view has to ask for data very quickly, doesn't it? It needs to find things out really quickly so it can quickly load the data in. <coughs> it can only ask three questions. The view, the, uh, the uh, data source, 
delegate allows it to ask three questions or three methods. The first question is, how many sections are there in this table view? And normally the answer is probably going to be one. Okay, if everything's together in one big table view. But you might have lots of sections. So you need to tell it how many sections are go they're going to be. So this information has to be available. Then it says, right, I'm currently looking at section zero. How many cells, how many rows should there be in section zero? Okay, so it knows how many cells to put inside that section. And one that the parameter you get is the section number. So, so the function, the method gets called, you get past the section number, and it needs to know how many, how many rows are in the section. <clears throat> the third one is the most important. What data should be in a specified cell in a specified section? So it might say, give me this cell for cell 5 in section 3. And then very quickly, cell 6 in section 3. And as you flick through the data, it's constantly asking for data from the data source. But it never has any more data than it can display on the screen at any one time. It throws the other data away, it doesn't need. So you have to answer these three methods. And those are the three methods, those are the three data source methods that you've got to put something into for this to work. And all I've done for the time being is, is to put some dummy values in, just to get things working. So the first question is, number of sections in table view. And it, you have to return an NS integer. That makes sense, doesn't it? So I'm going to have one section, return one. I've got one section in my table view. Next question is, number of rows in section. And I'm, I'm passing an integer value, which is the section I, I, I need to find out about. And I have to return an integer value of how many rows there are in that section. Now, because there's only one section in my, in my uh, table view, I can just return the number, can't I? If there was more than one section, I'd have to have some business logic which works out for each section how many rows there should be. So if you've got an alphabetical thing and it says how many rows in section zero, or well, section zero is A, if it's alphabetical, so I need to go into my data source to find out how many records begin with A, and then return that number of records, return the, the number of uh, rows. And the third one returns a UI table view cell, which makes sense. It says table view cell for row at index path. So I'm given the table view I care about, so one of the parameters is pointed to my table view, which is good, isn't it? And the second parameter is an index path, an NS index path. An NS index, NS index path is a structure. It contains two integer values. It contains a section value and it contains a row value. That makes sense, doesn't it? So you can see there I've said, um, but I haven't said anything, I've just, I've just ignored it completely. Okay. Now, when I create my cells and I design my cells in my storyboard, I have to give them an identifier, which is a string to identify that particular cell design. Because I might have lots of different cells for different purposes in my table view. I might have big cells and small cells and cells with big text and small text and graphics and no graphics, so I can mix and match my cells. <clears throat> in this instance, I'm looking for a cell with an identifier of cell with a capital C. And then what I do is I create a table view cell. So I can then set the properties for it. But look at the, look at how I create it. I don't allocate it, a table view cell. What, where's my table view cell come from? What's the object or class that I'm using? The table view. The table view maintains a, 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 a collection of spare cells. And what this does, this special method says, DQ, <coughs> DQ reusable cell with identifier for index path. <coughs> it's saying, find me a spare cell, which I can use for this particular index path, row and section. If you can't find me a cell, build me a new one. Create me a new UI table view cell. And that one line does all that. At the end of the day, and that gives you a cell pointer, a UI table view cell pointer. Then all I have to do is, it's got a text label. I set the text property for it. 
in my cell object and I return the cell and that gets added to my table view. So this method is really important. You have to be able to answer the three questions, number of sections, number of rows in section and exactly what's going to be displayed in that cell. What does give me a cell for that particular section and row. <clears throat> so that's how it would look, that example. So this, it says test five times because I've said number of sections one, there's one section, there's five cells in the section and each cell has the text test in it. Okay, so you can see how those how, how that came came about. But that's not very useful, is it? That's, that just gets us through the, uh, the first hurdle. We need a data source. We need somewhere to store our data to be displayed in our table views. And what we're going to do for this particular exercise, this particular assignment, we're going to use a mutable array, an NS mutable array as our data source. In the second assignment you do, we're going to use something called core data, which is an object database. But for this example, we're going to keep things very simple. Core data is an object database. Mutable array is a, it's just, it's an array which we can add and remove indexes. <coughs> so my first job is I need to create my NS mutable array. And it only needs to exist inside this object, doesn't it? Inside my view controller. So I make it private. I don't declare it in my header file, I declare it in my implementation file. And I specify NS mutable array items, uh, I synthesize it. So I've now got a private set of properties, getters and setters. And in my view did load, I'm gonna just chuck some values in there just to get things going so I can test it. So I alloc in it, my NS mutable array. So I reserve the memory for it, I initialize it so I have an NS mutable array. And then I add object twice. I add two indexes to my array. So that'll be zero and one, won't it? So I've now got an NS mutable array with two indexes in. So there's my modified data source methods. So let's see what's changed. What's the first thing that's changed in here? Yes, the number of rows in section I need to count how many indexes are in my array, don't I? And that's what I've done. Self.items.count. Every collection has a count property, which returns the number of items. <clears throat> so that's really simple, isn't it? What's changed next? There's only one other line of text, one other line of code has changed in this, this code. What else has changed? There's only one line. Go on, what is it? Yeah, not database, the mutable array. You can see that I've said cell.textlabel.text equals self.items object at, in, at index. Remember, my index path has a section property and a row property. All I care about is index path.row. So it'll ret so return zero for the first cell and one for the second cell. And I'm simply going to my mutable array and just pulling out the record to display in that, in that cell. Straightforward. The only complication for your assignment is going to be that for each cell, you're going to be storing more than one value. You might have the text of your note, <coughs> you might have the title of the lecture, you might have the date in there. If that's the case, your mutable array wouldn't be storing strings, it would be storing dictionaries. Remember, a dictionary is a key value pair. So you might have a dictionary with a a text, a title, and a date in, and that dictionary gets stored in the index. So it means when you get to this step, the first thing you've got to do is extract a dictionary, haven't you? And then get the value out of the dictionary. So the only difference is with your assignment is you're going to have more than one value, therefore you need to use dictionaries inside your array. The principle is exactly the same. And there's the, there's the uh, table view with the two values displayed. I'm now going to show you three more things, well, more than three, three critical things. We need to be able to insert new records into that table view, don't we? We need to be able to delete records, and it'd be nice to be able to change the order, wouldn't it? Put them in a different order. Now, if you've got an iPhone, you know all about how that works. 
you've got the edit button, haven't you? Then you've got these little minus, these little no entry sign things, which you tap on and the delete appears. Or you can swipe, can't you? You can swipe across to the left and the delete button appears. I'll show you both of those. And also, when you, when you go to edit, you can click and you can actually drag the rows, can't you? And rearrange the rows. I'll show you that as well. So you'll be able to produce interfaces which match all the human interface guidelines for table views. Before we do that, a few small little things to go through. Headers and footers. I always add two extra methods to my code. Table view title for header in section and table view title for footer in section. And if I return nil, it doesn't put any titles in, but I like to drop that code in so I've got the option of putting some titles in my, uh, in my page. So there we are, there's another one, do I do it? Let's go back a page. There's the basic methods with returning nil, which means there's no headers and footers. This one says, if the section is equal to zero, because the section's one of the parameters, title equals items, return title. So just like the data in the cells, you can simply, you get told which section it's interested in, and you just tell it what the title should be. So it's treated just like the data source for your, uh, for your table view. Trigger and segues, right. This is the tricky bit. This is the bit that takes a bit of getting your head around. Normally, you have a table view. You want to tap a row to drill down to a detail view, don't you? An edit screen or another, another table view and drill down again. The easiest way to do that is in the storyboard. You've got your cell prototype. You control drag to the next view and you choose a push segue just like we did last time with buttons. And that's great, except there's one problem with it. You need to know which cell's been tapped, because when you run the program, you might end up with 300 cells, and they all point to the same, the same view. So what we need to do is pick out which cell's been tapped on. Ideally, the index of the cell, don't we? Because let's imagine I've got 10, um, set of lecture, set of 10 lecture notes, and I tap on the third one. I want to pass the data from the third note into my next view down, don't I? If I tap the 10th one, I need the data from the 10th record passed to my second view. So I need to know which, which cell's been clicked. And there's two ways of doing it, and I'll show you both. When a cell is selected, it calls a special delegate method with an NS index path parameter. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? So when you tap on a cell, the delegate method knows the section and it knows the row index. Okay, which is all you need, isn't it? If you know the section and the index and the row index, you've got everything you need to be able to uh, push the right data through. So here's the delegate method. Table view did select row at index path. Makes sense, doesn't it? So every time you tap on a table view cell, it fires this delegate method. And as you know from your work on segways, which was two weeks ago, you could, last week, was it really only last week? Just my brain's going. The, um, you know that you can trigger a segue, can't you? Yeah, perform segue with identifier. So all you'd have to do is drop that into here, perform segue with identifier, pass the identifier with segue, and bang, you can pass the data across, can't you? That's the first way of doing it. <coughs> How did we do it last week? How did we uh, trigger segues? What was that method called that we used? Prepare for segue. So let me show you how in prepare for segue you can still you can identify the section and the rows. Because I think some of you, if you're used to that, you might want to do it, do it that way. Uh, well, let's finish this one off first. So here we are. T did select row at index path. Um, table view cell, blah, blah, blah. Returns point to cell. This is quite cool, by the way. Accessories. Every table cell has an accessory type. It could be a disclosure indicator, the little arrow thing, the little chevron to drill down, a disclosure button with the information sign on it. In this example, I'm using this method, did select wrote index path, to put a check mark at the end, a little tick at the end of my cell. And all I'm doing is I'm, I'm past the table view, aren't I? and I pass the index path as two parameters. If I combine those together, I can say UI table view cell equals table view, 
cell for row at index path, index path. And I've got my table view cell appointed to the exact cell that's just been tapped on. And I can toggle, I can set the accessory type to UI table view accessory check mark. And if I left it at that, you know when you select a row, it goes a different colour, doesn't it? It's a grey colour, a bluey-grey colour. It would stay blue-grey. Which if you're doing shopping this, for instance, which is your lab task, that's no good, is it? So this is quite cool. It says table view, deselect row at index path, animated. <clears throat> which means you tap, it goes dark, and it fades away. So you get this nice sort of animated fade effect going on. And if you want to go really crazy about this, you can toggle things. Because accessories are read-write, I could even read the current accessory type and then decide what I'm going to do based on the current accessory type. So this one says, um, if, it's, if it's got a check mark, remove the check mark, else add the check mark. And whatever you do, fade the selection away. So with that one, you can just tap on rows and add check marks, remove check marks. <clears throat> and that demonstrates how to use table view did select row at index path. So that's a really cool, really cool feature. Prepare for segue. It's gone off the bottom of the screen, but it's only the last row. Here we are. You can get the index path because if you have a table view in your view controller, you can reference it with self.tableView. It already gives you a property to access the table view. So wherever you are in your code, self.tableView gives you a pointer to your table view. And, if, and because you've selected the row by tapping on it, you've got index path for selected row. That method's available. So you can return the table view, and you can also, the table view tells you which row's been selected, which was the row that's been tapped on. So then you can prepare for sake where you can create an instance of your edit view controller, you can pass the values across to it, and you can launch the segue. Okay, so is that, is that helping? Is that making some sense? It's all in the video as well if you get, uh, if you get stuck. Toolbars. We faked our toolbars, didn't we, in, session, in uh, lab three? Yes? We faked toolbars. I'm going to show you real toolbars this time. Yeah, the full fat version. The trouble is, when you have a table view controller on your view, it occupies the whole of the view. You can't move it up a bit to make space for another view to add some buttons on. So we need to create a toolbar which sits over the top of our table view controller. And to add a, add a toolbar, I'm going to show you an alternative way of doing it. You can drag toolbars across, but we don't do that. The navigation controller, the navigation controller, not the view controller, <coughs> has some simulated metrics. Top bar, bottom bar, status bar, you can tell it what toolbars you want in your interface. The reason we do it this way is because it then applies that toolbar to every single view in the application. So it's consistent. What you don't want to have is a toolbar on one screen, then you go to another screen, it disappears. And it comes back somewhere else. If you want a toolbar, you keep the toolbar for the whole app. You can change the bar button items on every single uh, toolbar, but if you're going to have a toolbar, have it across everything. And there's my toolbar, and there's my bar button item. Now, can you see, that's a bar button item, which is a button. This is called a flexible space. Because they start at the left and work their way across, if I want to write a line something, I simply drag a flexible space in, which is a subclass of, of uh, bar button item. There's another one, plus. So I've got one on the left, one on the right, separated by a flexible space, which kind of is like a, like a spring. It pushes them apart. Now, it'd be really cool, you've got all these buttons, look, there's one there in the, uh, in the navbar control, there's one there, there's another one there. It'd be crazy to have lots of IB actions, wouldn't it, for every single bar button item. It'd be nice if you've got six bar button items to have one IB action that they all trigger. Then you can just work out which one's being clicked. Well, the way you do it, you set up your IB action like you do normally, and then you see this little circle you drag from there, just drag it on top of all the other bar button items. And that will attach the same IB action to all those bar button items. 
So it's just you haven't got to right click, you just hold over, hover over there, it goes into a cross, you just drag it down onto each of the bar button items. And that gives you the same IB action for all of them. Because your toolbar contains an array of bar button items. And because it's an array, guess what? You can add your own your runtime. You can, you, can, you can remove bar button items at runtime. You can add new, new buttons. And you just simply change the array property. So basically, remember how when we put the view in the view controller, it gave a property called, um, remember we had the extra properties, the title and the subtitle and the rest of it at the top. As soon as you put it inside the view controller, you've got those, those extra properties. Well, as soon as you, you add a toolbar to a view, you get another property called toolbar items, which is an NS array. And when you've got that, you can start adding new buttons at runtime. So in this example, I'm adding a new button called new into my toolbar. So I create a bar button item, alloc in it with style, with title, style, target, which is where its delegate's going to be coming from, and the selector is the method that's going to get triggered when that button gets clicked. And then what I do, the problem is, uh, the toolbar items is an NS array. It's not an NS mutable array, which means what? What's special about NS arrays? <coughs> what can't we do to them? NS arrays? What's an NS mutable array? What does mutable imply? You have to remove things. So an NS array, you can't. You create an NS array, it's read only. It's fixed. So if we want to add new items, what we have to do, we have to create a mutable copy of our array and store it in an NS mutable array. Then we can mess around with it and add and remove buttons. <coughs> when we finish, we simply set it as the property as a toolbar items property, and that sets it back as an array. So we retrieve it as the mutable array, we add remove our bar button items, and then we assign it as the, as the array property. And that's how we add buttons to our toolbars. Again, you might need that in your assignment, you might not. If you don't need it in the first assignment, the chances are you might need it in the second one. Right, adding, deleting, rearranging. And we're good for time. If, you've, if you're not sure about uh, mutable arrays and arrays and dictionaries and sets, there's a video on YouTube which takes you through the differences and how you interact with them. So, two-step process. We need to add an object to the mutable array, don't we? A new item. Then we need to indicate to the table view it needs to reload the data again to display our new item. That's it. Seriously. I've just added a new item to my table view. I create the item, I add it to the items mutable array, and I call a special method called reload data on my table view. And that's it. I've just added a new item to the list. Okay, so do you understand that? Really simple process. If you're not sure, all these slides are on Moodle, if you want to go through them. There's also a video which covers this area as well. And if they're still not sure, there's a demonstration which takes you through all these steps. It's all involved in the demo. Have you, come across, have you come across this refresh control on your phone before? Where you pull down, then you let go, and you get this little worry. Dead easy. I'll show you how to do that as well. For this, for this assignment, it's not so critical, but for the next assignment, where you've actually got data coming from a web service, you want to have the option to be able to refresh, don't you? Refresh the web service and pull fresh data through. This is called a UI refresh control. And the first thing you have to do, you have to enable it in the table view settings. That's it. As soon as you've done that, you can pull it down and it rotates around. The only problem is like, it doesn't do anything and it never stops. Okay, so we need to do things, something about that. So what we do, we put this in on, on the, you put this, you put this set so when the application, when the view loads. Self.refresh control, because as soon as you tip, as soon as you choose that from the drop down list, you've got another property, which is a UI refresh control. 
just by changing that property and dropping that list down and saying enabled. That gives you a UI refresh control. Add target self, there's my delegate. For action selector, reload data, for control event, UI control event, value changed. Which basically means, value changed means I pulled it down. That's the method I'm going to create, reload data. And that's going to handle the refreshing the data and pulling it in and stopping the, uh, and stopping the refresh control. And that's it. There's my reload data. I pass it my UI refresh control pointer. Self.tableView reload data, well, that's what we did before, wasn't it? When we added a new record. End refreshing, which means it slides back up again. So all that really nice complicated animation and stuff is easy. It's really simple. You just you simply implement the UI refresh control. Deleting cells. You know about this delete thing, don't you, where you swipe across to the left now and the, the delete button appears. You tap the delete, it, it sort of dissolves away and then everything kind of slides up to take its place. Well, again, all those animations and transitions and mechanisms are done for you. All you have to do is uncomment two delegate methods. So the problem here is, let's imagine you start to delete and in the millisecond after you start to delete, you close the application down. If you've deleted the item from the mutable array, you've still got something in the table view which doesn't link to anything anymore. There's no, and everything's out of sync. Or if you delete the row, you've still got the data in the table in the uh, mutable array, which doesn't match. So we have to use what's, what's called a transaction. We start a transaction, we perform these two activities, we delete the data, we refresh the table, and then we finish the transaction. Two delegate methods. The first one, remember delegate is all about should, remember, remember shoulds and, uh, and uh, dids? Well, the first one is which cells are editable? Because you might not want all your cells to be editable. You might have some special cells to which you don't want to change or delete. The first one is which cells are editable, and the second one is gets triggered when you delete the cell. So the first one handles the swipe across, and the second one handles the click and delete. There's the first one. Table view can edit row at index path. And there's that index path again. There's the section and the row. And you return yes or no. So if you want it all to be editable, you just return yes. And as soon as you do, when you've done that, it knows it can delete. It knows you want to be able to delete the cells. The second method, and these, these are already there, by the way. You just need to uncomment them. They're in, they're in green. Table view, commit editing style for row at index path. <coughs> So if editing style is UI table view cell editing style delete, again, all, that's all there for you, we're going to stick our code here to delete the cell. Make sense? That's it's going to go just there. And there we are. There's the code. Self.table view begin update, which basically locks the data and locks everything down. Self.items remove object at index path, index path dot row. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because index path dot row is the matches up with the mutable array index. And this one, this is the longest one. Table view delete row at index paths with row animation UI table view row animation fade. And that's the bit that fades away and everything just slides up. That's it. So in other words, the only bit of code you've got to add is that's there already, it's just the transaction begin and end and removing the item from your musical array. Everything else is done for you. And the final step is reordering cells. Remember this reordering thing? You click on edit, and you click on the edit button here, it turns into a done button, and you can hold and drag and everything kind of folds around as you slide things up and down, you can rearrange everything. When you finish, you hit done, and everything locks down again. Well, guess what? Two more delegate methods. One, can it be reordered? And next one, do the reordering. But before we do that, do you notice this button at the top here, this, this done button? We've got to build that ourselves. 
we need to create a button, add a button to our navigation controller and set this text to edit. When we click on the button, we need to change the text to done and we need to switch editing mode on in our table view. So here's a very simple example. Here's my action for that button. The, there is a property called editing which tells the table view whether it's in editing mode or not in editing mode. So if we're saying if self.editing is equal to no, yeah, in other words, we send the, set the title to done and we set the editing to yes. Make sense? So if I've hit the button, I've checked the status, I'm not editing at the moment, so the, the button must say edit. I want to change that text so it says done. I, I want to switch the editing mode on. Otherwise, I want to set the title to edit and switch editing mode off. So I can toggle the editing mode now of that table. Do you see what's going on there? So I can, so I can go between editing mode with those little lines and these circles back to no lines and circles. And then we've got our two delegate methods. Table view can move row at index path. Okay, there's an index path again. So it's saying, is this row movable? Should I display that movable graphic at the side of this row? Should the user be able to move that row? And if you want, generally, the answer, the answer is yes, isn't it? You want to be able to edit the row. The second method is really interesting. Look at the parameters. Look at the, look at what we get past. Table view, move row at index path to index path. So we're given the index path of where the row currently is, and we're given the row of where the user's just let go. That makes sense. So that it started off to say position 10, the user's pressed it and slid up to position 5. So we'll get index path.row from this one will be 10, index path.row from this one will be 5. So what I've then got to do, I've got to mess with the mutable array, I've got to delete the item where it was and insert it where it's going. So there we are, easy, look. Self.items from index path.row, I want to store that string message, don't I? Keep it somewhere safe. I then delete it, delete that index, so it disappeared. And then I'm going to insert object at index to insert that same object in a different position. But all the user sees, they see this sort of wobbly thing where they can pick a row and they can rearrange rows and drag them up and down. And behind the scenes, your, your NSB array is going crazy trying to work out right that, go from there, delete, move. Yeah. In the background, it's got to keep sync with what's going on. So as you can see, <coughs> this is also exists already in the, um, in the template. You've just got to uncomment it. As you can see, building a, a table view with all these fancy mechanisms for adding, deleting, moving is actually relatively straightforward once you get your head around the data source and delegates. Okay, that's the key to this. The data source determines the data that flows into the view. The delegates control the can, will, editing, move, delete, and so on. So that's what we're going to cover today. Now, everything that you need to complete your assignment, we have now covered. So your lab this week, which I'm still finishing off, that'll be done this afternoon, promise. The lab for this week is going to be to build a shopping list, but you're going to have more than one piece of data for each item. You're going to have a, an item name and a quantity for each one. So you're going to be working not with NS strings, you're working with NS dictionaries which contain NS numbers, NS strings, and so on. Remember, every time I've, I've just got an NS Smith array of strings, I can simply pull the index out as a string. You've got one step before you do that. You've got to pull the index out as a dictionary object and then extract the values from the dictionary to display them and to edit them. But apart from that, everything's there. There are three videos for this week to watch, plus the demo. There's a video on collection classes. So we've got sets, arrays, dictionaries are covered in detail. There's a video on table views, which covers what this is, pretty much covers this. And the third one is on um, alert views and so on. Let me just pull it up, in fact. Your third one is on alert views, activity views, 
but probably not action sheets. That's a step too far. We'll cover action sheets um, maybe next week, maybe the week after. Alert views are the pop-ups that come on the middle of the screen. Ask you for OK or cancel. You did this before, didn't you, with the um, gesture. The activity view slides up from the bottom of the screen with buttons. You've seen this as well, haven't you? You probably slides up from the bottom. You've got these lots of wide buttons that appear. The action sheet, I'll leave in the presentation in case you fancy having a go. The action sheet is, it pops up and says you want email, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. And that does that. This, if you really want to have a go at that, if you finish everything else, I'll leave the notes in the, in the presentation slides for you. I'll have those at the end. But we'll cover those in more detail in a couple of weeks' time, I think. It's not hard, it's just I don't want to give you too much at any one time, because I know you, you're struggling a bit, aren't you, with some of the labs? A bit. Yeah. Who's, on lab, who's working on Lab 4 at the moment? Yes. Nice one, okay. So, yes, yeah, Lab 4 segues. Who's on Lab 3, which is the... Um, what was Lab 3? I can't remember. Yeah, the swipe thing, the keyboard thing, yeah? Working on that. Lab 2? No one's going to admit to that, are they? No. Lab 1? A bit of Lab 2. Okay. So you're kind of multitasking. That's very brave. So is everyone coping okay with the, with the labs at the moment? Next week will be a lot lighter because we're just talking about data persistence. There's not much to next week's lecture. I'm going to cover data persistence and I'm also going to cover the file systems because we're going to persist our data to a file in the documents folder of the application. So two smaller topics for next week. The assignment's due in, in two weeks' time, two weeks today. So if you haven't started your assignment, I would strongly recommend you at least stop planning it now and start working on it now. Okay, two weeks. Hmm? Why not? Oh, you've had today though, haven't you? You've been in the room today. And if you rush down, you've got another hour. Okay, don't let the other subjects suffer though. Um, quick show of hands, who's doing 305? 305, Modern Web 2, right. Almost every, you're doing it, aren't you? Yes, you're doing it. That's, that's the same, deadline's the same. So please try to get both completed.